Welcome back to the EMT Lecture Series. This presentation is going to be on shock. I'm Dan Limmer, here with my friend uh, Dan Batesy in the studio, and I'm going to start with a case presentation, which is going to frame the discussion we're going to have about shock. This presentation is a real case, one that I was on, like everything Dan and I talk about here. 25-year-old female patient was a passenger in a motor vehicle, turned left in front of their car, and she took all the impact in that passenger door. I pull up in the ambulance. I see the 25-year-old woman lying on the ground. The driver of the car is standing. Now, I think it's very important to note that when you go to a scene and you see someone lying on the ground and someone standing, there is probably clinical significance to that. But Dan and I will talk about that in a little bit. What's interesting about this case is I got to the 25-year-old female, recognized that it was a potentially serious trauma, did a rapid trauma exam, decided we had to get the patient out of there quickly, took a pulse, found out that it was very rapid in the 120s. We immobilized her, which we were doing at the time, and got her to the ambulance and headed out. So what's very interesting about this case is that we had to make a transport decision. I had to figure out whether we went to a local hospital or a trauma center. My rapid trauma exam did not reveal any injuries. However, with a pulse of 120, 126, and respirations that were relatively rapid, I was concerned about shock. Yet, if I were a passenger sitting in that car, it certainly isn't unreasonable for me to be a little bit worked up and anxious because I just got creamed right in the door where I was sitting. So to make a long story a little bit shorter, it turns out that on the way to the hospital, her pulse never came down. Even though I couldn't find a cause for the bleeding, I was profoundly concerned about shock. I contacted the doc at the local hospital, said we're going to bypass him and go to the trauma center. I think that was a good decision. The patient's vitals remained relatively the same on the way, despite the fact we tried to keep her warm and calm her down and give her some oxygen, making me think, of course, that there was bleeding. Now, every one of these stories has a twist. Of course, we get to the trauma center, and there was absolutely nothing wrong. I mean, there was nothing wrong with her. They picked the glass out of her hair and took the backboards off, and we were restocking the ambulance, and she left about the same time we did. And that puts us really in a great spot for a discussion, Dan, because I think it's one of the things, you know, we talk about the signs and symptoms of shock, and we'll do that in a second, but... Everything we, we do really comes down to more than memorizing signs and symptoms. It comes down to applying things to a lot of different situations. And that was one where I would do the same thing tomorrow. If that were my daughter or my friend or my wife, I would want the same thing to happen. But, boy, applying these things can be really challenging. Yeah, it sure can. And I think the important point of that lesson, Dan, is although you made a mistake, you went home that night and slept well. Um, sometimes it's just not that simple. And cryptic shock is one of the most difficult diagnoses to make, uh, especially given the circumstances. I mean, what are the signs of shock? Everything that makes you that, – that comes from being anxious, that comes from being scared, that comes from being cold, all those things can point us in the direction of shock even though shock isn't there. But the real danger and the real problem that we face is when we miss that shock. And uh, I think you made the absolute right decision and the absolute right thing was done for this patient even though it ended up being an, uh, incorrect at the end. Yeah, well, and that's and that's really what it comes down to. You're doing these things in very difficult situations. You're in the middle of the road, and there's glass all over the place. And even though we both write books, you know, people don't present like the book does. You know, so I think it's a great time to just to talk about some of the signs and symptoms. You know, she was anxious. She had a rapid pulse. She had rapid breathing. Now, her blood pressure wasn't uh, anything that was really remarkable. Now, there's not only the blood pressure, but there's also a narrowing pulse pressure, which is really important in shock. When the when the systolic and the diastolic come together, get very close, that's significant. And I will say that not only in practice, but even on the National Registry exam, recognizing that might be the only clue that you really have for shock and distinguishing the serious patient you know, from the non-serious patient. Yeah. We talk about the shunt to the core and the vasoconstriction that happens when your body uh, when your body uh, compensates for shock, and that pulse pressure, the narrowing pulse pressure, is the finding that indicates that vasoconstriction. That's the one that tells you that those blood vessels are shrinking down to 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 make pressure normalize, even though it's dropping. And it's a very important one for me. Yeah, it was when you when those blood vessels uh, constrict, that's essentially the diastolic pressure rises, the cardiac output falls, so the systolic pressure drops. 
drops and you're left with that, that narrowed pulse pressure. And I think the other thing that, uh, that we see, um, is pale, cool and clammy skin, again, a result of, of vasoconstriction. Yeah. You know, I think that, I think that this is something that everybody can read and bullet points in their book and everybody really kind of knows these things. So let's get, um, a little bit deeper. Uh, into shock. Now let's take this woman that I had. If she actually took a hit in that, um, that passenger side door, which would have hit her in the right side, the liver is right there. You know, certainly a bleeding organ. Let's talk about the, the, uh, where people bleed to death from. Yeah, sure. Well, certainly not, uh, not talking yet about external hemorrhage. If we just talk about the internal stuff. Absolutely. The, the liver is one of the big things. And if you think about any of the organs in the, in the chest and abdominal cavities, uh, are all high risk. I mean, there's massive blood vessels in there, the aorta, the vena cava, big, big blood vessels traversing that, that territory. But then you also have the dense organs, the liver, the, the spleen, um, the kidneys are all uh, do not uh, absorb blunt force trauma very well at all without causing some pretty significant damage and ultimately bleeding. Uh, and that's not to mention any number of other places that you can bleed from, the lungs, the heart, and several other blood vessels and, and all the other vascular organs in there. You could exsanguinate really and never have a drop of blood spilled outside the body. And that creates a, a you know, a particular, uh, challenge for us. When we assess these patients, you know, we're, we're doing that rapid trauma exam on the scene looking for some type of external force or deformity or something that may indicate what's going on on the inside. Uh, but that's not always guaranteed. Even the mechanism of injury doesn't really guarantee or rule out injury. Mechanism of injury is really, been kind of a flop as far as predicting injury. It's not as causally related uh, as we thought. And I think with internal bleeding from those uh, those organs, especially the um, the solid organs, uh, it's a problem. And they don't they don't report pain very well to us. Even if you have a hit in a football, we talk about car crashes, you can have a hit in a football game, an assault or something, you know, and the liver, which has a capsule, which kind of holds blood in, boy, the way people feel pain, it's like, oh, I've got horrible pain. It can be very diffuse and unusual with sudden decompensation. It's really, it can be a problem. Yeah, that said, I still don't want you to discount mechanism of injury or pain for that matter either. And I think it's important that you think about the forces that went into play, whacking this person, you know, crashing into the car. Those things are, are all still very relevant, although not 100% reliable, as you mentioned. I think that's a good point too. Um, same thing with pain. Um, certainly when you get hurt badly, it does tend to hurt more than not. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think it's also uh, important for us to be cognizant of the atypical presentation where the person doesn't have a lot of pain or pain in a different area, like, for example, referred pain into the shoulder from a spleen or, uh, or an, an organ like that. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point. I, I wasn't trying to to diss mechanism of injury. Um, you know, in the old days, in the old EMT curriculum, that mechanism, everyone just really said it was such an important thing. And I think that what we need to realize is that things are a piece of the puzzle. And when you're listening to this as a, as an EMT student or an EMT, I think that's what's really important. That if you look at a list of signs and symptoms of shock, not everyone is going to have the same value when every patient. It's a sliding scale. That's right. You know, and and the different things that happen is you say, you know, shoulder pain. And you know what? If you look at a patient and they look sick, if you get that gut feeling, and I I really do believe gut feelings are valid, it might be a patient that's anxious and pale. It might be the mechanism. It it might be that there's just something that you you sense is wrong. I would always say um, to listen to that. It's always better to err on the side of caution and get a shock patient to a facility capable of handling that rather than taking them someplace that can't and they have to be urgently transferred, which, which may be too late. Yeah, 100%. I agree with you 100% on that. You know, there's an old saying in medicine that says the typical presentation means that about 30% of the people actually have that presentation, which means a lot of people don't. But uh, nonetheless, we want to recognize patterns when those patterns appear, and it is important to, to sort of play the odds. And I think the odds would have us moving in the directions of mechanism and pain and things like that. Um, and the second thing, I, I think what you said was very important, which is if you're going to be wrong – 
be wrong on the side of doing the best thing for the patient. You're not going to hurt anybody by over-treating them, but you will hurt them by under-treating them. All right. I think that we've really talked about signs and symptoms now and and put it together, hopefully with an insightful um, approach to our listeners, that when you look at things, it's not going to be cut and dried every time. There's going to be things that are going to surprise you. Then, of course, there will be grounders, you know, too. So it's important to do that. So let's talk a little bit about pathophysiology. And when we get into shock, we've talked about the the pulse pressure and and vasoconstriction, but I think it's probably worth talking a little bit more um, about that pathophysiology here. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, simple things, you know, when you read it in your book, you say, well, this is a mathematical equation. You know, cardiac output is heart rate times stroke volume. You say, well, what does that really mean to me? And then, you know, blood pressure is vascular resistance and that cardiac output combined. But really, I think I think there's a there's a lot that that comes from that when we try and figure out what's wrong and when we try and figure out how the body responds to shock. That's really those those equations are just letters on the page unless you apply it. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's even where a lot of classrooms don't leave students saying, "Oh wow, this makes sense." Yeah, yeah. I think it's incredibly important to think about what needs to happen in the body. And if you think about every cell in the body, whether it's a brain cell or a finger cell or any cell for that matter, um, what they're requiring is glucose, uh, the fuel for the machine, if you will. And they create that glucose or they create energy uh, for the machine by breaking down that glucose and they do so with the aid of oxygen. Uh, And when uh, the body is working at its sort of tip top function, uh, it's getting plenty of glucose. Those cells are getting plenty of glucose and plenty of oxygen to break down that glucose very efficiently. And as a result, producing lots of energy and also as a byproduct, lots of heat as well. Um, When we go into shock and when we start spilling blood into our abdominal cavity or worse onto the ground, um, that delivery system is interfered with. We just can't get the cells, the things that they need most. And our body then has to begin to adapt to fix those problems. Our body begins to change to to keep that mean arterial pressure pushing blood around. It, It begins to change to keep our heart delivering more pressure into the cardiovascular system to get the cells that which they're lacking. Um, And when they begin to lack it, we see those signs of lacking, altered mental status. When the brain cell doesn't get the things it requires, it begins to stop doing the things that it normally does. And we get anxiousness and altered mental status and things like that. Um, A very early and reliable indicator of a problem. Absolutely. There's really no such thing as a little altered mental status. That's right. If you see that, it means something. Yeah. And the brain's an incredibly oxygen hungry organ as well. Um, Three out of every five drops of blood in our cardiovascular system go to perfuse the brain. Uh, So it does not do well when we interrupt that flow, when we interrupt that uh, perfusion is probably the better word to use there. Uh, And when it becomes hypoperfused, we can begin to see that problem happen right away. So when we we talk about cardiac output, we talk about blood pressure, I think where we really need to take those home is how the body responds to fix those things. When blood is spilled outside the body or blood goes into the chest or abdominal cavity, and I think I'll just throw in a, a little pearl here, is that if you find a patient that appears to have shock and they're not bleeding on the outside, there's a very good chance that it's in their chest or abdominal cavity. It's kind of a medical axiom. While multiple broken bones can do that, you'll find the broken bones. You know, profound shock in a patient that you don't see bleeding generally comes from those two areas That's right. Know, we, That's we right. talked about. So to respond to that, the body has some options of how they can get blood to the vital organs to get perfusion where we need to get perfusion to try and maintain the blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure to, to do that. And that includes vasoconstriction, increasing our cardiac output uh, and other things. Right. And don't forget rate as well. Right. A heart's going to compensate for decreased cardiac output and, and also decreased mean arterial pressure by beating faster. And that's one of the most telling signs of shock that we find. It's not the only telling sign and it's not 100% reliable, but it is a very important finding that if you're seeing tachycardia in a patient that has suspected shock, we should really increase our likelihood of thinking shock in that case. Yeah. And I think that realizing that tachycardia may very well be relative, a geriatric patient that might be taking a beta blocker, or even a geriatric patient not taking a medication, or you know, young patients, and there's a lot of different variables that go in there. Again, this I think comes back to the whole picture kind of approach, you know, to the patient. 
But not only do we increase the heart rate, which gives us more squeeze, which therefore increases our cardiac output because we're, in, we're increasing that to a certain extent, getting that cardiac output increased. We also breathe faster to bring more oxygen in to help keep, as you say, the, the brain especially, but keeping oxygen in that blood we're pumping around. Yeah, and I think if you're talking about pearls, one of the most important pearls that I've learned over the years is that a person with a rapid respiratory rate and no appreciable reason why it's rapid, you know, so you don't put your scope on their chest and hear wheezes or something like that, but you're looking at the person and going, why are they breathing 40 times a minute with clear lung sounds? To me, that screams shock at every level, whether it's septic shock or, you know, hypoglycemic shock. I've seen shock Cases for like sure, that. For They're sure. lying in bed. And right. they're breathing at 28 or 32 times a minute, not exerting themselves. Right. That is really uh, an important thing. And I think the listeners here hopefully will pick up on these things when they go out and practice and when they take the National Registry exam. That's right. All too often we're stuck on these these normal ranges. You know, respirations are 12 to 20 and we have to memorize those. But someone lying in bed with a respirator rate of 24 and not exerting themselves may in fact be in approaching shock, whether it be you know septic or something else or have some other major clinical issue. But all too often we say, well, 12 to 20, 24 isn't so bad. Everything is important in the place that it's in. Yeah. And I think, I think you said it best earlier when you said it's a piece of a puzzle. And there's a great deal of conversation around shock these days in the literature and a lot of experts talking about it. And I think the one point that everyone is making is that there's no one finding that tells us anything. There's not one reliable thing where you look at just heart rate and say, well, their heart rate is this, therefore that. Uh, That's not the case at all. And in fact, it has to be the big picture. It has to be uh, a constellation of findings, many different findings pointing you all in the same direction. When I teach my students, I always talk about how when a newspaper reports a story, they don't go with just one source. They report multiple sources saying the same thing. Uh, We would consider it junk journalism if they use just one source. Well, the same thing when we make assessment-based decisions, we're not going to use just one finding. We're going to look for multiple findings all pointing us in the same same direction. And that's really what we need to be thinking about with shock. So to wrap up kind of this uh, pathophysiology section, we've talked about the way the, the body vasoconstricts, we increase the heart rate, we move blood from the skin to the important parts you know, of our body that, that need it, you know, the, the brain and our, our kidneys and our things that really, you know, filter and make us and make us work. And let's talk for a second about types of shock. I think it's important for the pathophysiology that we just really briefly, you know, it used to be that we had neurogenic shock, and anaphylactic, and septic, and we've really brought them down to four functional types. And I think it's really important to think about those. And we could probably relate all the things we've said to those. The distributive shock. Distributive shock, you have the same amount of blood, but the blood vessels open up. Anaphylaxis is an example of that. When we, when we have that open up, uh, those blood vessels open up and there's other causes as well. We have obstructive shock, might be a pulmonary embolus or might be a tamponade. Tension pneumothorax Tension as well. Tension pneumothorax, you know, anything that, that blocks that obstructive type of shock, you know, we, those, that pressure builds and our low pressure vessels in the chest really can't, can't hold up to that. Um, then we have cardiogenic. There's times we have uh, an MI or rhythm problems and the heart's not working anymore. If the pump fails, the cardiac output drops. So that whole side of the shock equation uh, is totally there. And then finally, bleeding. We have hypovolemic, but low volume might also be diarrhea in an infant or people that have been, you know, haven't been drinking and, and sweating and, you know, low volume may actually come from more than just blood loss. If you, if you remember that the leading cause of pediatric death worldwide is diarrhea type disorders. Uh, more kids die from that than any other cause worldwide. Uh, that's a really relevant thing. And these kids are dying from hypovolemic shock without losing any blood. It's all relative hypovolemia, but just as deadly nonetheless. Yeah, I think it's important that when we talk about this, you know, many times we go through all this stuff and then have a, you know, a pediatric section. I think it's important to say that kids may, you know, just a, a, a young, young child or baby that's not feeding well and has a gastrointestinal problem has the potential to, to really be in shock, as do the the child that's hit by the car and other things. All these things apply to kids. And I think it's important in all these lectures that we do to mention that pediatric thing because it's not a separate chapter. It's a population that we do come in, you know, and uh, we do come in... uh, 
in contact with. So I think it's important to talk about those those functional um, descriptions of shock to, to really talk about all those things. Now, we'll do separate lectures on heart failure and anaphylaxis and other things. You can go back to those, but I think those things are, uh, are an important part of that. So Let's get into treatment. And we talked as we were preparing for this uh, this audio segment, and you've got some some really big thoughts about treatment. So I'm just going to hand this right to you because your thoughts on bleeding and and maintaining temperature um, are are just amazing, and they're right on the money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think first and foremost we have to think about what what's causing the problem, and just like with any other pathology, we have to think about how to fix that problem. Uh, if we're talking about a trauma patient, as our scenario started out, I mean, we've got to think about how do we get those holes closed. Uh, and that means getting them generally to an operating suite somewhere where a surgeon can can close the holes that are leaking. Um, that said, uh, I think there's a lot of things we should be thinking about on scene and a lot of things that we don't think nearly enough about on scene that, that contribute to the overall morbidity and mortality of a trauma patient that are reasonably correctable. Uh, the first one that comes to mind are all, well, the first few that come to mind are all really primary assessment based stuff. Uh, I think we have to be thinking about uh, airway and breathing. In this particular case, um, we know that uh, as a person becomes more acidotic, uh, as they lose the ability to keep oxygen in their bloodstream, um, they uh, begin to fail in their ability to clot uh, their blood. And uh, so that means that keeping them breathing and, ox- and well oxygenated is a very important part of keeping the bleeding under control. Um, We've also talked, and we will talk a great deal more about external hemorrhage, um, but controlling that external hemorrhage. And um, again, as, as we talk about massive hemorrhage in another chapter, um, I, I don't want us to forget minor hemorrhage as well, because every platelet that falls to the ground is one less platelet that contributes to clotting the blood in the body. And if the person is uh, bleeding from a lacerated liver, we may not be able to stop that with direct pressure and tourniquets. Um, but the small little bleed on their arm that we can do keeps those platelets inside. And although it may only be a couple hundred mLs of blood, that's still a couple hundred mLs of blood they've lost on top of the liters of blood they may be leaking inside their belly. So I think it's never too early to be thinking about stopping all bleeding. And this can be done still keeping your eye uh, on the on the big picture. Because, Absolutely. you know, when you're sitting in the MT class, you're thinking, how am I going to do all these things? But many times you've got an ambulance crew, sometimes there's an engine company or or even a somebody else that can put some pressure on and and do that. EMS is a team sport. Yeah, and it's important to think about what the priorities are. What's really important? You know, we look and we say, well, we're only going to deal with you know with major bleeding. But I think it's a good point that when you have people that that any bleeding you know does contribute to the problem. Yeah. The other thing that we have to think about is that. Uh, our body keeps blood inside its blood vessels in a process called hemostasis. And that hemostasis occurs under optimal circumstances in the body. It occurs under a normal pH. It occurs under um, a normal temperature. And when those those elements uh, become different, when they change, for example, when our pH drops because our body becomes more acidotic or when our temperature drops because of hypo, uh, hypothermia, um, that coagulation process doesn't work as well as it did when things were normal. Uh, and again, uh, if we're allowing that to happen, we're actually fighting against the body's own ability to clot the blood. And although we may not be stopping the bleeding with direct pressure, keeping a person warm is going to contribute to stopping that bleeding just by allowing the body to do what it naturally does. So we really need to be thinking about that, in particular hypothermia. Uh, in particular with shock, the big thing that we have to think about with hypothermia is as that person becomes more hypoperfused, as they cannot deliver the same amount of oxygenated blood to the cells, the cells begin to switch over to a process called anaerobic metabolism. And in anaerobic metabolism, it makes less energy, but it also makes less heat. So the very basic status of the body is losing heat, even though it's a warm day, even though it's 80 degrees outside, uh, they're no longer generating heat in a process of thermogenesis anymore in their own body. So one of the problems that we see with these guys, with these patients that is, is that their core temperature is dropping, even though it's not really cold outside. Uh, For example, we had a, a student the other day that was working on a patient in a a fairly routine extrication of a pretty serious uh, trauma patient. Uh, They were outside. It was uh, early September, so the ambient temperature was above 70 degrees. And uh, 
the extrication went on for about 20 minutes. And uh, when they finally got him in the ambulance, they took the temperature of the patient. And the temperature, the patient's temperature was 95 degrees. So just the very prob, the very basic maneuvers of getting him out of the car and extricating him would drop that patient's temperature a, a, a significant amount. And the problem with that and the significance of that is that as that temperature falls, so does that person's ability to clot their own blood. So if we're not thinking about hypothermia management right from the beginning, we're putting an impediment up against us in terms of the fight against shock. So we should be thinking about insulating that patient and covering them up and uh, perhaps even putting some heat pads, uh, some hot packs uh, on their chest and, and armpits. Uh, these are all things that the military is doing now and are you know relatively untested, but still we believe to be important. Yeah, maintaining maintaining temperature um, doesn't have to be you know crazy. We're not putting them on bake three fifty. You right. know, we're just trying to ninety eight point six is a great happy number. Yeah, and when your external environment. You know, maybe thirty or forty or fifty or sixty or even eighty. You know, I think it's I think it's important to you know to note that. So I think that just to recap those things, and I think it's really really great to talk about some of these things, especially that are, that are up and coming. You know, that that are just so important, and we and the people listening to this, you know, might not have even heard in class, but something that can be done. Let's just talk about the treatment again. The primary assessment, making sure that their airway is open, that they're breathing, and that they're getting oxygen. Oxygen is still you know, right now, uh, appropriate to give to a major trauma patient. You know, all the cardiac stuff that's out there says, you know, 94%. But if you've got a crashing trauma patient, you know, we still believe oxygen is appropriate. Then we have bleeding control. We have circulation. I'm a really big believer in the primary assessment. If you come on a patient and, stu- right, listen, students out there, I want you to pay attention to this. You walk into a station in class, you know, a lab station or a practical scenario, and you say, hi, I'm, you know, I'm Dana from the ambulance. And the patient says, oh, I've got this. And then the first thing you say is, well, the ABCs are okay uh, because they're talking to me and they're oriented. If you haven't touched the patient in your primary assessment, if you haven't reached down to just to feel a radial pulse in that patient that's talking to you, to feel the skin color, temperature, and condition, you're missing stuff. You might, because of that, not not identify shock until later in the exam. You're going to lose five, 10 minutes. That's a lot. So, you know, get that pulse, you know, the rapid pulse, the pale skin, the clammy skin, the mental status, all that stuff is in the primary assessment. If you have a patient that you believe is serious at the end of this primary assessment, you kind of make that, that priority determination when you say, okay, is this a fast or a slow call? Is this patient sick or not sick? That takes us into the um, secondary assessment. The secondary assessment can be done you know, rapidly on scene and then continue en route. And I think this is where a lot of the decisions that we make come together. So we like to try and finish with some insights and some variations, things that you may find on the street, things that we think may be helpful and things that may be helpful um, on the national registry exam. And I'm just going to go back to things that we've, that we've talked about is that the basic signs and symptoms, the elevated pulse, elevated respirations, uh, anxiety is a very early uh, sign And skin color changes, I'm not sure if I said skin color changes, you know, those things, the pale, cool, clammy skin are very, very early things. Blood pressure is a late sign, but we might see a change in the pulse pressure, a narrowing pulse pressure, you know, before that drops because vasoconstriction raises that diastolic pressure while falling cardiac output lowers the systolic pressure and that brings that that, um, pulse pressure together. I think there are times on the street and there are certainly times on the National Registry when you read those test questions, there's going to be one thing that's going to stand out. It may be the pale skin color that indicates some type of vasoconstriction, might be the narrowed pulse pressure. But I think when you read those questions, understanding the pathophysiology and the things we talked about um, are really, really important. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I think that's um, it, taking the test is one thing, but treating your patients well is another. And I think that pathophysiology conversation has to be in your head when you're doing your assessment and looking at all these findings. For the sure. difference between understanding why what you see is happening versus memorizing a list of signs and symptoms is is a difference between a you know an average EMT and a great EMT. It's that understanding of what they see. When calls make sense to you and you look at those things and you say, oh, this is bad because they're vasoconstricting and that means there's something going on in the body, that's different than saying, oh, pale skin, that matches the 
my bullet list from the from the book. Understanding is is really important. All right, um, Dan and Dan um, signing off uh, from our shock lecture. <laughs>